Hello, beautiful ladies. It's Karen here. And in this lesson, we are going to look at myths and trends to be aware of in the fitness, weight loss, and body transformation space. Now, this goes back many decades because I counted up 50 as I was creating this presentation. Likely, there's a lot more out there that I'm not even aware of that you guys are probably hearing and seeing. So, um, you know, they're coming all the time. But what I want to do is go over the old and go over the new. So let's head into the old myths of the 1980s to 2000. And a lot of them will overlap. But seriously, when we have the myths and trends, what happens is it takes us away from a straight line to success. And the myths and trends tend to continue on. And they are creating misinformation and untruths for those of us that are wanting to head into a positive and successful and sustainable body transformation. So let's head in. So take pen to paper and let's see where we go with this. Okay, I've got 25 that I came up with in the old myths um, in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Um, first of all, let's start. A vegetarian diet is best for losing weight. Not necessarily. So this came out. I still have friends from the, the 80s and 90s that are doing vegetarianism and nothing's changed, but they still insist that it's better because it helps with weight loss, even though when they don't see it in their body, they're not convinced. Um, and, and really, it still is about calories, guys. And we'll get into a little bit of the vegetarian versus carnivore stuff. But as far as a myth goes, it is definitely a myth. And there's absolutely no research and no proof proof, no scientific proof in this whatsoever. So again, this is where we say calories matter, guys. Number two, this was a big one in the 80s, fats will make you fat. I don't know if you remember the fat-free craze where everything was fat-free. And that's also the advent of artificial sweeteners coming in and fillers uh, coming in. And what happened was it made people more hungry. And here's the deal. When you pull anything away from the body, if it's not getting the nutrients, it will hoard. And so it hoarded the fat on women's bodies because they weren't getting enough fat. And when you put healthy fats in, I'm talking healthy fats, the omega-3s and 6s, when you put those in, the body will release fat. So you actually need to eat fat to lose fat off the body. Um, and the no fat craze also was just making it so we had a lot of artificials in our bodies because we were trying to make up for the lack of taste that fat gives, but also fat is, um, it, it manages satiety. So it makes you feel fuller longer. Ask any competitor where we have to take back our fats for a while and we're starving, even though the calories remain. It's because the fats make us feel fuller longer. Number three, eat your brekkie to increase metabolism. So I like to eat breakfast, but uh, the reason I eat breakfast is not as a metabolism boost, but for me and my clients, and hopefully you guys too, what it does, especially with the protein in there, at least 20 grams, what it does is it levels out the blood sugars. And so you don't go on that roller coaster where if you're just having granola and fruit and berries, then that's all carbohydrates. And so what happens is the pancreas then is shooting out insulin to try to manage because it's just carbs and there's no protein. So um, eating your brekkie to increase metabolism uh, is not necessarily the case, but this is still one of the ones that maintains today. There's other good reasons to eat um, brekkie, but there really is no improvement in metabolism. It might raise it a bit, but honestly, when you wake up, all your all, all your bodily things are starting to ramp up, right? Number four, skipping meals will help with fat loss. This, again, a lot of women do this still, and this is the advent of keto and intermittent fasting and all this other stuff. And, and um, they still think if, if you take away a meal, 
it will help with fat loss. And that seems to be the easiest for some women. Not so much these days, but uh, back in the 70s and 80s, for sure, there were women that would forego breakfast or lunch um, in order to try to not eat as much, but uh, it, it doesn't work as far as fat loss. If you have less calories, but sometimes you make up those calories because you're only eating once or twice a day. So we have to be careful with that one as well. And skipping meals does not give us the bounty of macronutrients that we need to build a strong, lean, shapely body and to keep our metabolism strong and our biochemistry strong. Number five, spot reducing. Oh, come on now. Everybody falls into this one, okay? I still have women saying, well, what should I do for abs? I'm feeling really soft around the abs. What, what should I do? Crunches, planks. I'm like, oh my gosh, here we go again. Okay, so the muscle does not own the fat around it. So there's no direct line from your abs to the fat above it. So again, you guys know intuitively, but we still fall into this, that it is about our nutrition. So spot reducing is not possible. When we are building muscle, we can build muscle, but that fat will come off the body in the way the body puts it on. And everybody's a little bit different. Some hold it more in the lower body. Some hold it more in the upper body. Different... Um, different backgrounds, different, uh, different kinds of uh, people say have different body types as well. And so that's just a genetic uh, built into your DNA, um, depending on your, your background. So spot reducing is not possible guys. Number six, cardio is needed for weight loss. Some say cardio is the best for weight loss. I still see women choosing cardio first and do a little bit of weight training after. Turn it around. Major in weight, minor in cardio. Cardio is great if you want to have a little added boost, but I still see women, especially women aging over 40, they're still maintaining cardio is the best thing. If you're moving your body and you're sweating, you're losing fat, not necessarily so. You can lay out in the sun when it's hot and you're sweating and you're not losing fat. Right. And so you can't even correlate um, your sweat with how hard you're working or how much fat loss uh, is happening here, too. So the um, cardio is not necessary for weight loss. Competitors will do it, of course, because we're going to extreme guys. We're getting down to 10, 11, 12 percent body fat. It requires extreme measures. But um, and that's why also when we stop the cardio, uh, if we stop it too much and, and then we start to eat again because we've missed it for so long, we add the weight on fast. It's not because we're not doing cardio. It's just because the body is shifting from a very extreme sport. So this is where after years of competing, most seasoned competitors know how to do it more progressively. So uh, cardio is not needed for weight loss. And again, I always say there's a difference between um, structured cardio, which I see as going into the gym to do cardio, like the elliptical, the stairmaster, the climber, whatever, and other stuff outside like walking, power walking, hiking. I don't consider that cardio. I consider it activity. And that stuff uh, we shouldn't barter with. That should be a natural part of everyday living. So there is a difference between activity and exercise. And when you're exercising, you're going into the gym and you are working on the nine muscle groups with an integrated program to hit each muscle group. Cardio is just um, a cardiopulmonary uh, routine. And I always say do cardio after your weight training if you want to induce uh, some fat loss, but it also is bringing all of the toxins and all of the um, all the lactic acid and whatnot out of your body. And so it's a nice way to end your weight training. Number seven, lift lighter so you don't get bulky. This is where I often would hear when I started in the 80s, oh, you're gonna look like a man. No, 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 it was my first boyfriend when I was 20 taught me that. Cause I had that same thing I said that to him. He's like, no, you're a woman and it will put muscle on your body according to a feminine body. Now there are some women that may be more manly or more muscular. And they are more gifted in that way, but we will not turn into men. And unfortunately, the 80s was when all of the big um, 80s and 90s, the big steroid users in bodybuilding for women happened. And so a lot of people looked at that and thought that um, not understanding the steroids and the assists 
uh, performance enhancing drugs that these women were on. And they assumed that um, that would happen from lifting heavy weights. It, it, it doesn't. So you can put that one to bed as well. Uh, number eight, low weight, high reps is best. So um, this came along because again, women were afraid of getting bulky. So they kept the weight low and they did higher reps because they wanted the long, lean muscle look. The long, lean muscle look is how your body is. Some of us don't have long, lean muscles. It depends on limb length, tendon insertion area, genetics, basically. Um, and again, some women are more adept at building muscle. That's the minority, but it does happen without any kind of um, drugs or enhancements. It's just the way they are. A lot of the Eastern European countries um, from their citizens, they are just built differently. Uh, sometimes um, women of black skin descent, they have a better um, ability to also build. It's just in, in, their, in their genome, guys. Um, if you lift too heavy, you'll look manly is number nine. I think I already covered that one. Uh, I lift as heavy as I can and I'm still 120 pounds. <laughs> so it ain't true. Number 10, do the master cleanse to detox and lose weight. Okay, so hopefully none of you guys are ever doing the master cleanse again. This was the lemon syrupy cayenne pepper cleanse that uh, when I was in the health food stores, everybody was doing. And uh, <laughs> what it does is it allows the body to rip the muscle off because it's going to keep the fat on, especially the longer the cleanse you do. What happens is the body will drop a bit of fat, but then it will compensate and it'll go, oh my gosh, she's still not feeding us. We have to survive. Fat is our survival supply. Let's drop the muscle because muscle is also very taxing. It weighs a lot and it's very active. And in a body that's not being nourished, it goes, okay, we can't afford to put all this energy out into the muscle uh, because we have to survive here. And fat requires very little energy. It just sits on the body. So the body will take the muscle off. So the master cleanse, yeah, you'll lose weight. But if you had a body fat machine back in the 70s and 80s, you could look at it and go, holy shit, I've lost five pounds of muscle. <laughs> it wasn't body fat. And then when you start eating, guess what happens? The body goes, oh my God, I need this. And I have to put it into my fat supply because we can't have that happen again because it starts the feast or famine um, uh, roller coaster, which is what our ancestors from 100,000 years ago that's what they lived off of. They didn't get to eat all the time and they were nomadic. They moved around the planet trying to find animal supplies. They set up shop in, in certain climates and certain areas to get the animals. And they would have to try to store stuff over the winter to sustain us. Sometimes they would run out. So the body got used to hoarding and managing because there was not a steady food supply. We have a steady food, food supply now in our world. And so it's really, really important that we don't trigger that. Um, you shouldn't feel hungry when losing weight, or if you do, it's a negative. That's number 11, that's not true. Tolerable hunger is a, it signals a healthy and working metabolism. So we're supposed to eat, close the door, and then not eat in another two to four hours. Um, when the hunger starts to grumble in our bellies and go, it's time to eat. So hunger is actually necessary if you want to lose weight. It, we don't mean hangry, guys. We're talking just tolerable hunger. Number 12, three meals and two snacks are best to keep blood sugars level. Well, again, we are getting in the way of a healthy metabolism if we're constantly throwing food in there before we even feel hungry because the hunger mechanism is part of a healthy metabolism. And for people that have erratic blood sugars, it's usually because they're eating crap. They're not eating enough protein. They're eating carbs. They're eating um, processed food. They're, they're eating stuff late at night, whatever it happens to be. And you can get back on track with three square meals if you choose to. And that is where you level blood sugars. But the blood sugar also relies on protein. That's why our protein is so, so important, guys, because it acts like a sponge to sop up the excess carbs. Carbs meaning sugar and berries or um, a muffin, they are still acting like sugar in the body. So get your protein in there for sure. 
Snacking is healthy. Okay, that kind of goes along with number 12. So this is number 13, snacking is healthy. It, it can be, but I still see it as a way to um, soften and dampen the workings of a healthy metabolism that says hunger is supposed to be there. A lot of times we send our kids to school with snacks and some people snack all day or they call it grazing and that's fine. And some people can actually stay lean while grazing. But again, that's more um, their genetics than it is how they're eating. And usually grazing might mean a few bites here or there. So we've got to be really careful with how we define snacking. Um, and if we're constantly eating, honestly, it's it's very time consuming. Um, I eat three times. Sometimes I have a snack or some people look at my meals and go, that's a snack. <laughs> no, it's a meal for me. So how you define it is really important as well. Number 14, eat certain foods to boost metabolism. So this is still one that maintains today. I still see it. Acai berry, green tea, spicy foods, uh, cayenne, all that kind of stuff. Oh, no, it heats your body up. You start sweating. So that means that you're losing fat and it's raising your metabolism. No, not necessarily. It may raise your metabolism by like 2% for half an hour, but you might lose one or two calories. Come on, like when we're eating like 1700 calories, guys, uh, there's no research around it whatsoever, whatsoever. Um, setting small goals is best. Okay, so this came out and I love it because it was Arnold Schwarzenegger that went, hell no, I don't set small, I set big. So we talk about the North Star. We talk about envision, you know, into the future. How do you want to look? How do you want to feel? What kind of clothes? What does a day look like for you? For me, um, small goals might be increase your water and you're having two liters of water a day. Okay, that's fine. That's a small goal. But if we start with that small goal and stay with it for two weeks, there's so many other things that need tending to. It's going to take you forever to get there. So this is where when women come and work with us, we have uh, a food plan done. So we put macronutrients in there for you based on your experience, your goals, your diet history. So that is in there and you can take your hands off the steering wheel. So that's kind of nice because they don't have to think about, but that's a huge change. And the other change is here's a workout. This is suited for you. Let's get your body moving. Let's start with at least three days a week. Those are big goals, guys. But if we can get those two things in place, then we can start moving into other goals. And before you know it, in a three or four month program, which is what I run, they have hit a lot. And this also requires accountability and a lot of coaching. But what it does is it's moving, moving the needle uh, pretty fast to the other side. But I also want them to really dream about well, how do you want to look? What does that look like? And, and don't, uh, don't be afraid to dream. That's what we need, because that is how we want to envision our world. And when we dream it and we feel it, then all of those resources come into play to make it happen. The people, the habits, the thinking, all of that stuff. So I say dream big. I've never really dreamed little. <laughs> Just keep dreaming big, guys. Um, number 16, fasted training helps weight loss. Oh, dear. Well, sure, but what kind of weight is it? So fasted training means you wake up in the morning, you don't eat, and then you go to the gym. I'm not talking about a walk. I'm talking training. So we're talking weight training here to build the muscle, shape, tone, uh, tighten, all that stuff. If there's no food in the system, what is it going to use, guys? It doesn't go for fat. Remember, if we have gone on, uh, remember the feast or famine of our forefathers from 100,000 years ago is built into our DNA. If we do not have the food, then what happens is it says, okay, well, if we're going to drop fat or muscle, let's drop the muscle. Let's drop the muscle. And because um, we've got to maintain the fat because this person's doing this every single day and it's not healthy and we have to maintain. So it's really important that we um, start video. Oh, yeah. It's really important that we maintain that. Sorry, I was just looking at my, at my little uh, Vimeo here. Um, you need to eat, guys, before you lift. So depending on how much you're lifting and, and, and where your strength is, your body needs the nourishment. I do not support fasted training. Eat less, move more. That was something that came out. Sure, but it's not that simple, guys. 
Um, but it is a basic. But sometimes in the 70s and 80s, they said, that's all you need to do. That's all you need to do. That usually came from genetic people who's, who it was easy for, <laughs> right? Not for the rest of us that are hard. Eggs cause cholesterol. No, they do not. Cholesterol, 80% of all cholesterol is created in the liver. That's why we have to love our liver and stop with the stress and challenges in our brain and stop with the toxins in our body and the shitty food because everything goes through the liver. Everything we put on our skin, up our nose, uh, on in our mouth, everything we drink and eat, but also emotional toxins as well. It all hits the liver. And so eggs got a bad rap, but there's no science behind it. Um, number 19, detox in January. Okay, don't we all love to just detox and, and all of a sudden we can just eradicate 50 weeks worth of shitty eating in, with two weeks of a detox. Chinese medicine says the best detox is eating whole foods 365 days of the year. And I totally support that. Um, number 20, it's aging. Number 21, it's hormones. These go together. It's just your age. Age happens. Everything slows down. Or it's just your hormones. It's inevitable. Both can be challenged and changed, guys. So again, that is old stuff and it is an excuse basket for a lot of researchers too, who, who don't even consider any other way. And women who have been training and eating for decades on this path and consistently not winging out. It is a very different biochemistry, very different results and aging and hormones have very little effect when you've been managing it for your life since a young girl. So that's really important that you understand that. Number 22, eating meat is bad for you. It increases heart disease and cholesterol. No, no, no. The kind of meat does, if you're eating commercial, remember they are, they are fed hormones and antibiotics. They're fed shitty food. They're eating corn. They're not supposed to be eating corn. Their omega-3s are low in the meat. They're saturated fat and all the toxins are high. And that gets housed in the fat of the meat of the animal. So... Um, there is no uh, correlation between heart disease and eating meat. Brazilians eat more red meat than any other country, and they have the lowest rate of heart disease or four times lower than us North Americans because their meat is clean. They don't do a lot of the shit. Maybe it's changed now, but back in the 80s, they didn't do a lot of that shit to their animals. They didn't feed them a lot of that stuff. So again, another myth busted. 23, artificial sweeteners will help you to lose weight. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. No. So here's the thing. They did a study on 170,000 women. I believe it was down in Iowa. This was in um, hmm, 2000s, I guess. And what they found was calories actually dampen the little gagger meter in your mouth that says, I want food. And so it satisfies it. When you don't have food, when you don't have calories, your hunger continues. Your hunger does not get satiated because it's satisfied, not just with the food in the body, but what, what is in the mouth. And if there's no calories in it, it doesn't satisfy your hunger as well. The other thing is um, it does add to the fat cells not wanting to release. And I have seen this time and time again, and research has shown this. And what happens is um, when I got women off of diet pop, because they didn't even think to mention it in their um, food uh, journaling to me. And then I would ask them and I would say, okay, drop it. And it was really hard for them to drop it because it's a mind thing, but it's also um, something in the, in the mouth that's satisfying. One girl was drinking six diets a day and she's slowly weaned to uh, water in two weeks. She lost three pounds a week because her fat cells were then able to let go of the excess in there, which is usually just toxins and stuff, but that also adds into the cellulite. And there's no research around that. I've just seen that myself. There's definitely research that has proven that diet foods and sodas and pop add to increased hunger and they um, add to decreased fat loss. Um, the blood type diet. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. There's so many things out there. There's, uh, this is, these are the last two in the old myths, blood type diet, the parasite diet, candida cleanses, heavy metal cleanses. Okay, guys. I mean, if you like to, and you think it helps then then fine. What I often find is that what helps is they put a little diet plan in there to tell you to eat these foods. And usually that is the 
um, the part that helps people <laughs> to lose the weight is because they are now tending to their food. And so when we start doing these cleanses, we tend to change other areas. And that usually is causing the success for our fat loss uh, in the body. So please be, be careful with that. Okay, let's go on to the new myths, shall we? Whoop, there's the new myths. Okay, so these are, <laughs> these are my little lemmings. So lemmings, you know, the thing about lemmings is they're not very smart. And one jumps over the edge to death, but all the others follow and go, oh, okay, well, we'll follow because they like to follow in the majority in a crowd and they do what everybody else is doing. So this is what I see around myths and trends is that people tend to want to stay in a group because there's conformity and safety in a group. And this is where I would rather live in the minority because too many people just buy into stuff. And we see this with keto and intermittent fasting and all these things. There's always a new diet. I call keto the office diet because every office around, every government office I know of, they're all doing keto, right? So it's pretty crazy. So let's get into the new myth. Number one, you can increase your metabolism by eating more often. Or put another way, your metabolism is slow because you aren't eating enough. It ain't true, guys. It can be true to a certain extent, but because um, you can soften your metabolism or it doesn't work very well if you're not eating much. But really, <laughs> this came about, I can't remember the doctor's name, but she made a ton of money and wrote a book about it because she came up with this brash statement that said, you need to eat more to lose weight. Well, didn't that just satisfy every woman on the planet? Wow. I get to eat more and it's going to increase my metabolism and I'll lose the weight. So there's a certain place of no return and it would happen pretty fast. And so if I have a woman that's eating once a day, and I mean, just once a day, not snacking, nothing else, just once a day, if I can get her to eat twice or three times a day, but take the same calories that she's been eating in that one meal and spread it out over two or three, yeah, it makes a difference. How much it will top out. Again, for some women, it's negligible. For other women, there can be a big oomph. But I want women to eat more often because we do need to bring in the nutrients. And if we're moving our body in healthy ways, it needs the nutrition. So for sedentary people who make that a lifestyle, eating once a day suits them because they're not expending any energy, guys. They're not expending any energy. Um, but if I get a woman moving, then absolutely, she will have to feed more often and everything ramps up. It's like turning up a, a light bulb, right? Turning up the dimmer switch. That's just kind of how it works. That's metabolism. Number two, eat more often to lose or eat less more often. All right. So that's kind of the same thing. So what, what they're saying is, and it was Lane Norton that put this uh, research to bed and he's in the bodybuilding space, natural bodybuilder. He has a PhD in nutritional science and biochemistry. And he took people and he had them eating three times a day. And then, of course, us competitors eat like six times a day. So a lot of people look at us and go, holy crow, look how much she's eating. Uh, she must have a really fast metabolism. If I eat more, that'll happen too. No, it's because we're starving all the time, guys. It's because we're training for like an hour and a half every day, six days a week, and we're doing cardio as well. So again, it's the extreme. But he took the average lifestyle athlete or average people who are moving because you need to have a body moving in order to have a good cohort, in order to have good stats. Okay, it's not for couch potatoes. And um, he had them eating three meals and then four meals and then six meals. There was no difference in weight loss with the same calories over eating at three to four meals or eating at six meals nothing changed. So you don't get to eat more to lose the weight. Or if you take your calories or your meal and you split it up throughout the day and eat more often, but keep the same calories, there's no difference. So for me, honestly, I don't want to eat five or six times a day. I found that hard in competition because it's, you're always thinking about it and you've always got to prepare. And I ate three meals and sometimes a snack and I still went down to 11% body fat from the other contests where I was told to eat six times a day, no difference. So uh, the proof is in the pudding for sure. Number three, carbs make you fat. I sure hope that you're kicking that one to the curb, guys. That's insane. Shitty carbs make you fat. Shitty food makes you fat. Processed food makes you fat, right? 
you need your nutrients, you need your fiber in there, you need your enzymes and your vitamins and your minerals. That feeds healthy cells. Carbs are not the enemy. And um, I'm not going to go into the pros and cons around keto or even just try to, to nix it because you should know this by now. Most people are not doing a keto diet, by the way. They are just doing a I'm not eating shitty carbs diet is what it is. Mm. Uh, rant over. Number four, change up your exercise program every few weeks. This is what the newbie girls are doing. Well, I've been doing this for four weeks. I have to change it up or my body will... Um, what do they call that? You need to have muscle confusion all the time or your body will stop growing and progressing. Not true, not true, not true, guys. Sometimes I've had women on the same program for three, four, five months. Sometimes I will change it up because there's boredom. That has nothing to do with the ability to progress in tightening and toning. That is a mindset issue. And so you need to... Um, you need to understand that more is not better. Better is better. If you're making gains, if you're staying consistent with your training, if you're throwing in some variety, if you choose to like strip sets or drop sets or giant sets, stuff like that, but still stay with the same moves, um, you don't have to change up your exercise program every few weeks. That's usually for people that say variety is the spice of life or I get bored. And again, that's mindset, guys. Okay. Um, number five, you need to spend a lot of time in the gym to see results. Not necessarily, but I would say at least 30 to 45 minutes per workout. Sometimes with legs, it's an hour because you got, you got half a body to work there. It's a lot. So um, sometimes you'll see girls in the gym. And I did know one girl that I coached. She would be in the gym for two hours, but she ate a lot of food. She was in there. She was a trainer as well. So she was working in the gym. And she had a great physique. She won the overall BCs. She did really, really great. She um, was Scandinavian. So she came from a very athletic background. She had a, a lot of that growing up her whole life. So her body was primed already, which is a big deal. And she could train two hours a day without overtraining, without burning herself out. That is rare. Most competitors burn themselves out. We are in an overtrained state when we head up on stage and it's a very fine line and we need to be careful with it. But most of us are overtrained and certainly underfed if we're living at 10% body fat <laughs> for sure. And that's why the results do not last. Um, and that's part of the, that's part of the game, but you need to spend, I would say um, three days minimum 30 to 45 minutes for average change for me at this point. Um, it is five days a week. And it is um, 30 minutes to an hour, depending. And that's just weight training, guys. It's not all the other stuff. We don't count the stretching or the warm-ups and stuff uh, as well. So you, I would say, you know, aim for three to five hours a week out of 168 hours. That's manageable. Um, number six, weight train for weight loss. Oh, well, it's still nutrition, guys. So again, I say the weight training is for shaping and toning and working the musculoskeletal system and the weight loss is in the nutrition. It's in the kitchen. I separate them out and all this crazy stuff where they're doing these weird boot camp kind of things where you're lifting, you know, doing barbell curls for three sets. And then all of a sudden you're jogging on the spot for 30 seconds. Honestly, guys, that's not, it's just don't mix them up years ago in the seventies. We can go back to the old myths. We would see women on the treadmill. And they would have little dumbbells in their hands or walking and they'd have little dumbbells and they're doing little dumbbell curls separated out, focus on proper weight training and leave the other stuff for your nutrition and your movement outside of the weight training. That's best for weight loss. Number seven, keto, intermittent fasting, or if it fits your macros, we can add in paleo, we can add in raw food diet, we can add in, um, Oh gosh, there's just so many. There's just there's just so many so so much out there, guys. If you like to eat that way and you want to sustain it for life, then do it. But do it properly. Very few people can do keto. They don't even know what it is. Okay. I'm not even going to go into it because most people don't understand what keto is. They just have this fancy label and they're drinking keto coffee. Give me a break. What the hell is keto coffee? <laughs> Rant over number eight, vegetarian plant-based is best. Not necessarily. We covered this in, in the earlier old myths. Not necessarily. If you like it, great. 
manage your protein, make sure you're getting high quality, biologically available protein. Understand that in vegetarian and even worse in veganism, which I won't go into, but I do not recommend it for any women over 40 for various reasons um, and much research behind it. But the tryptophan, the carnitine, um, a lot of the amino acids are low when it comes to plant-based. And again, that's just research guys. And the protein molecule, which is 20 amino acids, is only as strong as the weakest link. So in um, animal, in um, dairy, eggs, that kind of stuff, whey isolate, all of the amino acids are high, 85 to 95%. So it's going to be a high biological available protein. It gets absorbed and utilized. In plant, uh, it often is between 60, 58, 60, and 70% because it's in plant-based and some of those aminos are low. So it draws the um, other aminos down to that level. So please be careful if you're doing that. Plant-based, again, I, I don't understand plant-based. Some people say they're plant-based. Does that mean only you're only eating plants? Is that what it means? Are you vegan? Or are you saying you eat plant-based foods? Because I do, I eat a ton of veggies. So I'm, again, I'm always unclear what people mean by that. And and they start playing with their food where it's pescatarian and carnitarian and uh, carbitarian. I don't know. There's just so many fancy and cool ways to name it. And people like to name stuff, right? They like to be different. Number nine, cutting out gluten will help you to lose weight. No research, no research, no research around this, guys. Okay. If you have celiac disease or if you have a proven intolerance, which has been proven through a doctor, that the filla in your intestines aren't working, then you have a gluten intolerance. Gluten is not evil. Uh, it's the processed foods that often have gluten in it. And there's now gluten-free everywhere all over the shelves. And this started in the 80s and 90s when I was in the health food store. Per, honestly, I can't stand the taste of gluten-free. Um, and it, But don't hang your weight loss on lack of gluten is gonna help, okay? Seriously, because you're starting, I call it again, playing with your food, or you're trying to find that one thing in mother nature that has caused all your problems and it's coming down the pipe and they're going to find it. And this is going to relieve everybody of their excess body weight. Nope. doesn't work. Fat burners are useful. Number 10. Uh, I always say this, and this kind of riles people up, but if you're using a fat burner, you're not doing the work. And what's a fat burner? So it used to be hydroxy cut, which they took out of Canada because it was harmful it was women were ending up in the hospital i don't know in the states if it's still out there i think it's been um, minimized as well because of the lawsuits there's um ephedrine which again in canada's really been downplayed uh i'd be careful with that kind of stuff as well um now we have ozempic and all sorts of stupid things there's always going to be wishful thinking when it comes to fat burners guys the best fat burner is a well-tuned body Number 11, a metabolic type diet. Um, this goes with number 12, hormonal type diet. There's all sorts of different, you know, define your body type and we'll find the diet that works for you. Okay, right, here we go. We're another mathematical equation. There must be a formula that fits like a piece of puzzle and it's going to be the magic that I'm looking for. That's the bright, shiny object syndrome, guys. Okay, so please be careful with that. Um, number 13, don't eat late at night for better fat reducing. I don't eat late at night just because I don't like the feel of it. I don't want to go to bed hungry. I actually, or sorry, I don't want to go to bed full. <laughs> I actually don't eat till full. I don't like the feeling of fullness. I eat till I'm satiated or a little bit less. We call that the Harahachi Boo, which is what um, they do in Okinawa. Japanese have done this for years. Um, as they say, the best way to lose weight is having long arms to push yourself away from the dinner table. <laughs> and I love that. I think that's so simple. Um, and also, if you eat late at night, what happens is your body wants to detox at night when you're sleeping. If there's food in there, it has to digest the food first. So this is why in my world with my clients, I always say don't eat two to three hours before bed. Go to bed saying, well, I could eat if I wanted to, but I'm not going to. Um, and then you know that you're in a state where your body's burned most of the food and go to bed and then the body can detox. The reason you aren't seeing results is because you're not training or eating properly. Okay, so this comes about with all those young trainers out there saying to women over 40, it's because you're not being compliant with your diet or it's because you're not tr trying hard enough. There can be some truth in that, but really what it is is putting the um, guilt and the shame on the client 
uh, rather than on the trainer who should be understanding training women in their 40s, how their metabolism is different, how we have hormones, how we have um, stress and challenges that causes the body to hold on to weight and it's overly acidic and it's in a chronic sympathetic state. All of these things need to be learned and that takes years of learning and putting hundreds of women through the coaching experience, guys. This is the long road. So I don't trust anybody, honestly, that has less than eight to 10 years of coaching. And I'm saying coaching, not being a trainer. There's a difference. Trainer trains the workout, coach coaches the person. Coaching is not that competitor has done a, done a competition. She looks great. She's now my coach. That's how it's gone. This is the new thing. Okay, great. Let's call it that. But I would never hire a competitor to be my coach because coaching is managing the mindset, the psychology, creating a cognitive restructuring of the unconscious beliefs, patterns, and conditioning. And that takes years and it takes certification and it takes managing and having success for years. So um, I, I really do have a, a hard time with, with hearing trainers, especially the young ones who naturally have youth on their side and they don't understand us older women and why we can't lose the weight or why we can't stay compliant or why we're frustrated with our hormones right um they ain't there yet i i see all the line all the time online women talking hormonal health and they're not even 30 right give me a break i'm sorry um number 15 if you want to look like her that girl in the gym just eat and train as she is eating and training now no she could have built that body over 20 years. She could have been in gymnastics or dance or track and field. Those seem to be the three biggest precursors where they've been doing it for years since they were a little girl, guys, not just, oh, I did some athletics in high school. Those bodies are primed and they've been doing it for years. And we look at them and go, just tell me what to eat and tell me how you train because I want to look like you. So please understand um, and also there's genetics and there's compliance and uh, all those other things. So we can't just pick apart what people are doing, how they're eating and how they're training and say, if I apply it to myself, I too can look like you. Rarely, rarely is that ever so. Um, I, number 16, I just mentioned this competitors make good coaches. I'm sorry, competitors out there. No, you don't. Honestly, when I competed in my 20s for my first show, yeah, I knew how to go into a show. I mean, I wasn't great because I gained 30 pounds in a in a month afterward. I was overtrained, undernourished, and then I ate my face off. Does that make for a good coach? No. It was after I did my seventh show <laughs> when I was in my early 50s where it all came, well, it came together before that because I was training uh, women, but not through show, but all the shows I've done has taught me a lot because I always did them organic, uh, no fat burners, no carb load, carb deplete, none of that stuff. It was hard work in the gym, hydration, sleep, and food as fuel. That's how I did it. Plus, I was coaching, and I've coached hundreds of women, probably, I don't know, maybe thousands of women by now in my 30 years of doing this. That is what makes for good coaching, plus my certifications, my nutrition, my um, yoga, my weight training, and my empowerment coaching certifications, all four hats I get to wear. So, and, and I apply them all the time. They don't just sit on a shelf with a nice little frame around them. So it's really, really important that we come to understand competitors do not always make good coaches, guys. They just don't. Um, Number 17, you can override genetics or limitations as long as you work hard enough. Now, this also was a part of the 80s, going through muscle and fitness, going through Shape Magazine, going through Flex, which came out after muscle and fitness in the 70s, where you do this and you work hard, you can do anything. Those people were on a lot of drugs and nobody ever talked about it, right? And I didn't have the discernment or the understanding to be able to look at a body and go, okay, that's not true. It has a different look, the musculature, the skin, everything has a different look. You really have to look differently. Um, and now I can see it. And now it's like, oh my God, I, I was fooled for two decades thinking if I train hard enough, I can look like her. Some are genetic freaks, but most are 
genetic freaks plus enhancements. And that's a lot of our IFBB pros guys. Uh, you really do have to have the genetics in anal drugs. That's for sure. You really have to have the work ethic and you have to have the genetics throw in drugs where you can continue to train. So you don't go into overtraining. So that means you can continue to build where a lot of us would just be like lying on the floor. Cause it's too hard. That's what drugs do is they allow you to lift heavier. So you get better results and you have faster recovery. So um, you really have to be careful in thinking that you can make it happen. Now, looking at the influencers out there and all the TikTok gals, all the young gals, they have amazing bods. And um, now we have uh, the platforms like social media for them to be able to be showcased where you see amazing glutes, amazing legs, amazing arms. You notice that they're always working the body parts that show the best because they're in video. And so they're known for those parts. So those are, uh, I've seen, there's one lady, I can't remember her name, but she's quite small up top, but she's got these big, gracious, beautiful legs. And it looks weird actually, to tell you the truth. Um, but she's known for her legs and um, amazing, like simply amazing. But that's where her genes are in her legs. And again, it's kind of a weird body, but she is out there rocking it. Anybody who wants to do glutes and legs, they're watching her. So you cannot follow what she does and expect to have those legs, guys. Do you have the genetics for it? Do you have the work ethic for it? It's usually genetics first. So please keep that in mind. Don't beat yourself up, okay? Your body's your body. Um, number 18, you can craft any exercise or sequence of moves and they'll all work. Okay, this is another thing the influencers are doing. Please be very careful. When you watch the TikTok, uh, when you watch the reels, YouTube, and you see these beautiful girls with these beautiful bods in this uh, the amazing outfits, and you see them string together, they're going to do a squat, and then they're going to do a lift, and then they're going to do a turn, and then they're going to do a thrust, and then they do a squat, and a lift, and a turn, and a thrust. And I'm looking at it going, what are they working? I don't understand this, this sequencing here, because there is a, um, there are rules to exercise sequencing that makes sense and what's happening is a lot of the cool girls are putting together their own moves and trying to outdo each other with crafting all these new moves that um uh when you look if you're talking to a kinesiologist they're like whoa that's weird that doesn't make sense so kinesiology and biochemistry um and the musculoskeletal system is going to be challenged in women our age if you're trying to do that shit so let the young girls do it. They're doing it for camera angles. They're doing it to look cool and, and it shows well, but there are certain moves and certain things put together. I, I would never, ever, ever put my women through. So please be careful of, of what you're seeing. And again, looking at their bodies and saying, oh, if I do this, I'll just look like that. It's not true. This is where body isolation, body building is still the best and safest and lowest injury result um, and the best for older women to do. And that is the basics for sure. Um, number 19, we're almost near the end. Number 19, you can't drink alcohol if you want to lose weight. Sure you can. I drink wine on the weekends, sometimes even during the week. But I have to manage it. I have to make sure um, I'm eating enough. And I'm not using alcohol and using it in place of a meal because then it's disaster. And so you really just have to weigh it out. And then how much? I, I have a little line on my wine glass that shows me the eight ounces, seriously, because I am not going to ruin 40 years of this hard work to get here uh, with, um, you know, drowning myself in too much alcohol and and seeing my gains disappear because I'm not getting the nutrition in or or some women try to hold back on eating because they want to have the wine and then they're shortchanging their muscles their um their uh, met metabolisms as well so please be careful with that uh eating meat is unhealthy and wrong okay I am not even going into that debate about eating meat is wrong okay vegans if you want to be vegan go for it if you want to be carnivore go for it. Always make sure your choices are rooted in your choice and you're not preaching. Okay. Please stop the preaching. You are not an expert. Whatever you want to do, you do. It depends on your goals, right? 
And my goals is to is to maintain the muscle and the bones and all that stuff. My research says I need meat to do it. And I may not like the idea of it, but I am not basing my food on an emotional choice. It has to be based on what I know, which is biochemistry, metabolism, healthy aging. So please be careful with um, where you put your um, where you put your judging and your presuppositions. We all do it, even carnivores. Okay, so please be careful with that. And it's not wrong. And it's not unethical. Many religions are based on eating meat. And so we can't go around the globe saying, well, you know, it's bad for you or it's wrong or it's it's inhumane uh, or, or whatever. And, and there's so many cultures that eat weird shit, right? And I'm like, well, okay. But again, let's put the judging to the side for sure. And I already looked at eating meat is not unhealthy if it's a clean source, if it's a, a traditional source where the animals or the fowl, the birds are raised outside, they're running around and they're eating grass, which is their normal forage. They're not being forced corn and all sorts of things. They're not being force fed antibiotics or hormones. Now with the avian flu, we do have to give some of our birds because we don't, that, that was a terrible thing. And, and it, it hurt a lot of people and it, and also wiped out a lot of birds, uh, the avian flu. So they do actually in a lot of birds still inject them with one antibiotic uh, at birth just to make sure that doesn't happen. I'm happy with that because nothing needs to suffer. And um, I'm, you know, being a purist is also often being judgy and it's a fear of loss of control. And so there's all sorts of layers to this, but we won't get into that now. So eating meat with a healthy animal and healthy respect for that animal is not unhealthy and it's not wrong. It is a choice and everybody has a choice to eat the way they choose to. I'm not here to tell you how to eat, but I'm here to support you in your eating style, which ensures that you're getting enough protein and carbs and fats. That's the basis of it all. Number 21, eating raw or uncooked is best. No, not necessarily. Again, we talk about this seasonal eating in the winter means warming up your food. Raw veggies, raw foods can be very, very tough for the body and our digestive enzymes um, start to wane as we age and uh, everything gets tougher as we age. And so I'm all about warm foods in the winter. You guys, a lot of you guys know this already. And you can eat cooling foods like berries and raw carrots and stuff in the summer because we're already warmed up. And again, this is just the wisdom of Chinese medicine. This is what I teach in all my coaching programs. And we go into how we eat and train and think along Chinese medicine and qi and the elements, the five elements. So, and the last one is you don't need supplements or vitamins if you eat well. You know, for some people, uh, that's fine. But what I find is knowing the research that our soils are depleted and we don't all eat organic, especially this day and age when the food prices are going crazy. We do what we can. I do have and I teach in my mastery program the basics of supplementation. So that means the vitamins and minerals that almost everybody needs, especially aging women. And they're not a lot, really. It's just it's just the five basics. And then we have the five basic sports supplements as well, which I won't go into. But um, sports supplements are the different things that we need to aid recovery and to allow us to um, be able to exercise properly and be able to fuel ourselves properly. Again, no nonsense, not a lot of money, but um, I do like to supplement. I do, I can feel it. I, I can definitely feel it in my body when I don't. And there's certain supplements that help with back pain. There's certain supplements that help with the immune system. And I've been using the same ones on and off for years. I got tested by a woo-woo guy and I brought all my vitamins in and we went through them all. And um, here's the other thing. If you're doing supplements, don't do them every day. Do them for like a week and two and then give it, give yourself a few days off because the level of absorption decreases. If you're going on holidays, leave your supplements at home, guys. Um, when we do the same old, same old, same old day after day after day with supplements, the body gets, gets kind of lazy in its absorption. Um, and that's why, uh, we can take a break and don't be so OCD about your supplements. <laughs> consistency over time, over decades is more important than consistency day in, day out. And then all of a sudden you fall away. So I hope that helps. So here's where I say the truth of all of this is turn off the noise, guys. 
Get off of Google. Stop listening to well-meaning family and friends that are not certified in training or nutrition or mindset, okay? Uh, say no to mainstream. I always say if mainstream's doing it, it's a good reason to not do it. <laughs> um, I like to be the unicorn. I like to be not necessarily a rebel. Um, I don't need to boast about being different, but I definitely live differently. I eat differently. I think differently. And that's just because um, I, I need to come to a more uh, intuitive way of living, which I've, I've worked on over the years, um, just because what was happening out there just didn't, it didn't sit with my soul. It doesn't sit with my spirit. And I see too many people in a group think, as we call it, or group talk where they're regurgitating the same shit over and over and over again, like it's truth. And it's just trends and myths and hype but it makes them feel comfy and they've got the lingo and, and they're doing like everybody else. So they belong and there's safety in that. I, I say there's safety in not following the crowd. That's just kind of how, how I live. And, and uh, I like living out on the periphery for sure. Uh, it allows me to stay quiet and sane and grounded in a world where most people are not grounded. Stick to the basics. They are your foundation. Okay. So lift, eat well, hydrate and sleep and tend to your mental and emotional well-being and do that day after day after day we do journaling we do readings we do uh, meditation in all in my program we do mantra work um and this is daily work those are muscles too that need to be tonified as well most people are lazy in their thinking and lazy in their habits and they are not realigning their body with their spirits so this is as much about spiritual transformation and sustainability as it is about the physical for sure that's how i see it keep it simple sister keep it simple it does not have to be complicated some people think the more complicated the better it is <laughs> no no actually the simpler the better it's not about going wider it's about going deeper more is not better better is better just remember that uh if it's too good to be true it probably is yep okay all right, all you bright, shiny object people out there trying to chase the next latest, greatest thing. Um, right, get quick schemes, <laughs> usually get you quickly into bankruptcy. And the final, if it's complicated, it's probably useless. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the, that's the McCoy wisdom coming out. Um, I see people overcomplicating stuff. I see people, especially in this day and age, the new stuff is, well, I'm going to do a bulk for 3.5 weeks, and then I'm going to do a cut for 2.3 weeks, and then I'm going to do another bulk. And they're treating their body like a fucking uh, mathematical formula where they can play with it in a way that is going to provide perfection. It does not. Guys, the messiness of creating a strong, sustainable body Body transformation is like the messiness of life. You go in and you putter around and you figure it out along the way. You don't sit down and write out a formula uh, because we don't eat numbers. We eat real food and the body does not comply. You could have the best formula in the world and guess what? Your body's going to go, uh-uh, no, that's not how I roll. And life is messy. And so you have to learn what I call go with the ebbs and flows of life. The ebbs and flows of your training, the ebbs and flows with your eating. We're not always perfect, but good enough is good enough. And it is the consistency in all things that is most important year after year after year after year. It is the consistency where people fall away, not the intensity, not the volume, not in the perfect food. It is in the consistency or lack of consistency. That is the mindset piece you must work on. Because for those of us that stay on the path, it's not what we do, it's who we are. We weave it into the fabric of who we are. We do not put our health and our wellness and our uh, weight loss and our food on the outside and go, well, oh, life happened. So I gave up on that stuff because it was on the outside burner. No, it has to be who you are and you don't barter with it ever. And when the shit hits the fan, that's when you need to feed your body well. That's when you need to move your body. Absolutely. That's when you need to go into the mindset stuff. It's not either or. Stop making it either or. Bring it into and fold it into who you are and make it part of your mantra. I call this loving yourself into health. 
I hope that helps, guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And um, I've got all the points in the document. So please download and enjoy.